I declared myself to be an atheist at some point in graduate school. And so, you know, naturally in 1993, when I was hired by UNC Wilmington, uh, they loved me. <laughs> I had all the right views. I should say I, I had all the left views at that time. There I was as a professor, uh, obviously doing really well, and they loved me. And then uh, the strange circumstance, set of circumstances that led me down to South America. I spent 17 days in um, uh, a teaching exchange, and they were actually voting on bringing back the death penalty that year. They asked me to give four lectures on the death penalty, and I made arrangements to go get inside a prison and just walked around for a few hours and completely changed my perspective on things, really. I mean, I know it kind of sounds crazy to say, to think that you could spend three hours in a prison or anywhere and have a, a worldview alteration, but it made me extremely angry uh, to just talk to prison guards and ask them, well, you know, what do you think about bringing back the death penalty? And they just, they laughed at me. And I was like, you know, why are you laughing? It's not funny. <laughs> We're talking about the death penalty. And they said, well, we already have the death penalty. And I, I said, you know, what do you mean? And they, they actually told me, they said when they had um, sex offenders or drug cartel leaders in the prison, they'd tell them they were free to go and open up the gate. And when they walked out across the prison courtyard, they'd shoot them in the back with a machine gun, bury them, and report it as a thwarted escape attempt, it, it, just like the Shawshank Redemption. They laughed about it. First thing I saw when I walked out of the prison was the statue of the Virgin Mary. It's up on a hill. I, I actually did look up at the statue and say, I, you know, I was wrong. I was just furious, you know, about what had happened and kind of needed some way to condemn it. And, and so it was a grasping of, of the moral law and just an immediate recognition that there's an absolute moral authority out there and cultural relative relativism doesn't make sense. And so immediately when I got back uh, to UNC Wilmington, I know that my colleagues recognized that something was different. I found How Now Shall We Live by Chuck Colson. On the first page of the first chapter, Chuck is talking about being in Garcia Moreno, a different prison in Quito. I really did take the time to study Christianity specifically and decide whether it was true and, and decided it was. While the, um, the um, Teaching evaluations from the students were very high. Uh, we began to see a decline in the uh, in the peer evaluations, and that's when really things really started to turn. When I went up for full professor on the the 14th of September in 2006, I had you know some concern uh, that the university might deny the promotion. Within a few days after the denial, I think it was five days after the denial of promotion, I got the letter explaining why I'd been denied saying that I was deficient in all areas, teaching, research, and service. I was sitting in my office uh, with a service award to my left, UNCW Professor of the Year 1998 in front of me, and uh, UNCW Professor of the Year 2000 uh, to my right. It was uh, very easy for me to pick up the phone and, and call ADF and say, let's, let's move forward with this thing. And uh, it was a very easy decision. My work with the Alliance Defending Freedom began back in 2006. Just you know, I, I thought that I was going to be a uh, an advocate for students' rights, and never really thought I'd be in the position of being a plaintiff. Um, I always had confidence in the Alliance defending freedom. Uh, you know, the idea that I could talk to students and say, if you've got a problem, they're the people that you need to go to. Uh, so I was really put to the test. You know, when I had this adverse action against me in 2006, there was never any question about who I was going to go to. I knew I was going to fight this thing, and I knew I was going to move forward and, and fight it with the ADF. And it was a very easy process. And also that's where we learned how committed that the other side was and realized that we were in the long haul for a very long fight because reasonable people, after document discovery and after finding that there were specific false comments made about me, that's where a reasonable individual would have said, let's settle this thing. Um, but they were, they were up to something very different. This was a much broader fight for academic freedom. The impact that this case has on academia is, uh, is very important. I mean, first of all, it shows that you know, professors, because of the ruling in our case, it shows that professors can speak out on issues of, uh, of public concern, on matters of public concern, and, and integrate that within their work as professors and not be punished for their viewpoint. It shows that a conservative can stand up and fight with the ADF and um, 
and that there is a chance. I mean, you know, David can face Goliath and prevail. If all of the people who were conservative and Christian at public universities were to stand up simultaneously and say, yeah, me too, you know, I've had bad experiences and, you know, he's not the only one that, that believes this way, they couldn't target us anymore.